coming up, proper nut psychology versus real engineering. That sounds like a pretty fair fight. This is actually one of the best nut questions ever, highlighting the nuance of the modern automotive nut. That's next. I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au, the place where Australian new car buyers save thousands off their brand new cars. Yes. Hit me up on the website for that. There are two kinds of automotive nut broadly, okay? The dog shit, dumb, rabid kind, which infests the comments feed down there, and reaches out to me pleasantly enough from time to time. A walking advertisement for the frigging Dunning-Kruger effect right there. And then, of course, there's the kind whom I actually love, albeit in a deeply non-fag way. I mean, pants on every time, okay? This is the nut with an inquiring but somewhat adrift mind, which is exactly what it takes, I think you'd agree, to become the creme de la creme of nut de la nut. Galileo, Copernicus, Kepler, Newton, Einstein, Da Vinci, Pascal, Bernoulli, Darwin, Pythagoras, Delabere, and of course, Marie Curie. Hashtag inclusivity. The list just goes on and on and on. Enquiring minds, all certainly, but where these scientific luminaries failed, the modern backyard automotive nut succeeds. You don't get to achieve hero nut status when you possess high-level technical competency, and I think you'd agree, this is ultimately what held these science types back, you know. Although Newton was almost a nut, because he believed in alchemy, of course, he was, you know, this close. Geniuses often are. And Einstein, of course, with the friggin' socks. I mean, come on. Today's correspondent is refreshingly unburdened by the millstone of technical competency. And this, I am sure, will shortly become clear. I would like to know if you think it is a viable proposition to use the air passing under or over a caravan to drive a 12-volt alternator for battery charging. I am aware that standard practice at the moment is to use the towing vehicle to supply 12 volts whilst travelling. I have a 2017 Tucson 2.0-litre CRD and have concerns about the smart charging alternator and other electrical systems in the car. I was thinking some sort of ducting leading to a Pelton wheel-type turbine only for air, not water. I have the workshop, lathe and mill, and fabrication equipment. The construction would be easy. However, I am at a loss on the physics, airflow, strength, etc. Voodoo. Is the fact that I have never seen or heard anyone else doing it telling me it's all pointless trying to build something to do what I've been thinking about? Many thanks for your time, JC. Congrats on the show. Look forward to every video. Keep roasting the nuts, mate. Yes. What a frankly epic question. But I guess this is what it takes, right? And that's why you will never be a nut. And I'm talking to you, normal, middle-of-the-road viewer who is not seriously considering putting a big ducted windmill under his frigging caravan. Authentic nutbaggery like this simply cannot be faked, no matter how much you really want to. To Rob here, I would say, thank you for your enthusiasm, re the show. We'll do on the ongoing roasting of nuts. Brace for impact there. Short answer, yes. Yours is totally pointless speculation of the export grade nut variety. So, well done there. Hashtag respect. But rather than roast Rob gratuitously here, how about we just use his question to illustrate the difference between the way um, civilians think and the way engineers think. Bear in mind, I am a profoundly shit engineer, which is kind of why I became a journalist. 
But even a shit engineer is a Jedi at applied physics, okay, compared with your average civilian in the shed. I'd suggest it is a uniquely male mental preoccupation to place a beer on one's gut and then muse as to the solution of a modern automotive problem which does not exist and for which there's absolutely no evidence beyond merely a feeling. This random musing, this process, right, it wastes valuable time which could, of course, be better devoted to thinking about boobies. This report proudly brought to you by boobies. Boobies, attenuating boredom worldwide, of course, ever since the very first Homo erectus, all those years ago. I mean, did you consider that brief interlude just then a waste of time? Clearly not, I think. You're still here, after all. We all love boobies, QED. Now, uh, back to the question. What, I wonder exactly, is the unspecified imagined deficiency with the Tucson's smart charging alternator and sundry electrical doohickeys, which begs for the supplementation of a homegrown aerodynamic ducted turbine charging system on one's caravan. What is it? A smart charging alternator, okay? It merely adjusts its output in response to load and or operating conditions, and it mainly does that for fuel efficiency, but also to improve things like idle quality, because drawing the full load at idle is going to feel a bit unrefined, for example. It's going to be sucking like 2.4 kilowatts from the engine at idle at full load, and that is going to feel somewhat undignified. Let's think about the van, okay? Caravan with a refrigerator running. Well, that's merely a bit of an additional electrical load, right? It's hard to see how that could punt the Tucson's smart alternator into an Apollo 13-style main bus B undervolt. I'm looking and I'm just not seeing how it would do that. And let's bear in mind, okay, the car runs off the battery. The alternator, it just keeps the battery topped up. So the battery is something of a shock absorber here, electrically. That's just how this works. The charger in the caravan, therefore, simply taps into the vehicle's battery like everything else. It's just a bit of additional electrical load. So let's think about the electrical demand coming from the caravan. In researching this response, okay, I found a 130-litre, 12-volt caravan-style fridge online, which would be fairly typical. Nominal power consumption of that fridge, 40 watts, okay? I can't imagine what else you'd need to power in the van, en route, so to speak, but let's just say you also have... I don't know, a vital cigar humidor, a filter for the moat around your bed, and an emergency inflation system for your inflatable, let's call them, uh, travelling companions, whom admittedly you really don't want going down on you, especially en route so to speak. So let us allow a hugely conservative total of 100 watts of electrical demand from the van and the van, both of those things, van, van, tomato, tomato, potato, potato. It's probably a van now that I think about it. While you're in transit anyway, call it about 8 amps at 12 volts. The alternator in the Tucson is probably 110 amps, and I say that, I guesstimate this too based on finding a 110 amp replacement Tucson alternator online. So the van is going to pull about 7% of the Tucson's maximum alternator capacity, absolute max, and that's if all the companions go down on you at once. But if it's just the fridge, okay, it's more likely to be 3% of alternator capacity, assuming no humidor and all the bendy-wendies maintaining, let's call it, um, 
hull integrity. This amount of load is nothing electrically. Three and a bit amps. I don't even know why you would bother charging this up in transit, okay? Because one deep cycle battery with 120 amp hours of capacity would run just the fridge at 40 watts for about 40 hours. Just plug the van into the main supply and recharge the battery when you get where you're going. How hard is it? But let's say, I don't know, just for shits and giggles that charging in transit was essential to you and the existing vehicle electrical system could not cope, not at all, because of your feeling. And bear in mind, okay, we're already in the domain of the anti-vaxxing flat earth creationist here, but let us see where this goes. I don't know why a wind turbine is the primary solution to this non-problem, okay? I really don't. Especially a DIY one that you make up from scratch in the shed. I mean, you can certainly get yourself a wind turbine off the rack online. I found one, a 400 watt AWS marine grade turbine generator with carbon composite blades and a maximum airstream speed capacity of 176 k's an hour, which is like 110 miles per hour. America. And it comes with a battery charge controller for under a grand. So that's nice. I mean, granted, it's not one that you made yourself in the shed at home with your own lathe and mill, yes. So it would probably work out of the box. That would be a salient differentiator. And you really can't make this kind of thing yourself at home without a wind tunnel and 20 grand. And if you want to do it with carbon fibre, of course, you'll need an autoclave as well. So good luck with that. The off-the-shelf one is comfortably over-engineered to meet the caravan's demands, I think you'd agree, but not that there aren't practical impediments to actually using it on the move. It'd be more at home on a ship, sailing-type ship for long distance, whatever, you know. However, one of the big problems here, for example, is that it is 1.2 metres in diameter. And fair to say, therefore, that you're not going to be putting it under the van anytime soon. And you'd want to stick it on a fairly substantial mast, I'd suggest, so that it manages to operate in the clean air, you know, the laminar flowing air as you drive through, the turbulent wake close to the van, you know, just not efficient. Ask any UH-1 Iroquois pilot about that, you know, taking off on a hot day, fully loaded in the mountains, bit of a problem. So there's that. I think you'd probably therefore want to stick it on, say, a 1.4 metre mast just to be safe, and it would thus project only two and a bit metres above the roof of the van, which of course would not really constitute a hazard or look fucking ridiculous as you drive from A to B. You could probably make the impeller smaller now that I think about it by putting it in a duct which is actually why the propeller on a modern turbofan engine on a jet airliner sits inside that curvy cowl duct thingo that you can see from outside. But then you'd really need that wind tunnel, I'd suggest, and the 20 grey budget, it's going to be a bit tight. So, of course, for the thousand bucks that you'd be spending on the off-the-shelf turbine, okay, the one, the carbon fibre one, you could just spend that money differently, I'd suggest, and get change from, say, procuring four additional deep cycle batteries. You could do that. If you just bought those instead, they would run the van on location and in transit with a couple of emergency inflations until the heat death of the friggin' universe. Just saying. Alternatively, you could spend 1200 bucks and fit something like 740 watts of solar array to the roof of the van. No mast required there. And if you add an inverter and additional batteries, which would probably set you back a couple of grand, I guess, that's kind of a low profile solution. And you can tap 240 volts directly out of that with the inverter. And granted, it's not going to be a carbon fibre propeller five metres off the deck on a stick, so you won't be able to advertise your elite nut status to passers-by quite so effectively. 
which is something to factor in, I suppose. If you've got it, flaunt it. But in short, I'd suggest that nuts are actually fascinating, and I could play with mine all friggin' day long, but from time to time, even I acknowledge it's also good to get a few things done. If you are an elite nut, as Rob appears to be, do not lose your inquiring mind, but do try to develop some technical skill and education before you crack on with these interesting projects in the shed at home. <laughs> yes, no matter how fascinating they see while you're musing over that beer. The technical thing is quite difficult, of course, and if it's too much for you, just remember instead, perhaps the best bet is not to solve any problems that do not actually exist. Instead, just think about boobies, our proud sponsor today. It's great for one's mental health. In fact, when I am elected your next prime mincer, one of my first official acts to make good on my campaign promise to make Australia less shit will be to pass the big bouncy booby break bill, which entitles all proud shit's villains, we sons of Anzacs, to five minutes on the hour, every hour, just to kick back and pontificate about boobies. Productivity will skyrocket, you mark my words, and the demands on the mental health system will plummet. For every five minutes invested in this satisfying way, the Department of Online Porn tells me the nation will get ten minutes back. So, far from being a self-indulgent waste of time, I put it to you that this five minutes of harmless respite, the big bouncy booby break, every hour on the hour, is something you can do and start doing today, patriotically, to make Australia less shit deep in the national interest. <laughs> I might take that break now, come to think of it. And the day I stop enjoying that, my fellow shit's villains, put me in a Huon Pine box and bury me deep at Maralinga. 